good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, it's truly an honor for us to be here today. I'm Command Sergeant Major John Wayne Troxell. I serve as the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joe Dunford. I also serve as the Senior Enlisted Advisor to the Secretary of Defense, Secretary Mattis. And on the panel with me here today are my esteemed colleagues and battle buddies. And I'd like to introduce them right quick. To my immediate right is the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, Sergeant Major Ron Green. To the far right, Sergeant Major of the Army, Dan Daly. To my immediate left, the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy, Steve Giordano. To his left is the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Chief Master Sergeant K. Wright. And to our far left is our Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, Steve Cantrell. You know, first, let me say first, it's an incredible opportunity for all of us to be here today, uh, all at one time to talk about the backbone of our armed forces, that being our enlisted force. We'd like to address three main topics today. First is uh, personal readiness, individual readiness, which includes uh, the manning, equipping, and training of our force, especially under the budgetary <coughs> constraints we have today. Personal policies that affect our servicemen and women, and where we are at with enlisted leader development both now and in the future. From an overall perspective, we can say that our U.S. Armed Forces are always ready to fight and win our nation's wars, but readiness under a resource-constrained environment takes its toll over the years. Our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen across the total force feel these constraints. If I have one takeaway from my travels and conversations with our troops around the world, it's consistency, consistency and predictability, whether that's with pay and entitlements or training and operational deployments, will go along to keeping our morale high. The services here are tasked with the monumental job of manning, training, and equipping the force to perform war fighting, peacekeeping, and humanitarian tasks. I'll let the gentlemen here with me today address their individual services but suffice it to say, our nation depends on our ability to be in the right place at the right time with the right qualities and capacities to protect our nation. And that leads me to the final topic, enlisted leader development. We know that without a doubt, our people are not only our most valuable resource, but they are also our greatest competitive advantage when it comes to fighting and winning our nation's wars. What we do to educate, develop, and empower our enlisted leaders will be the decisive factor in accomplishing the missions our country asks of us. And with that, we'll open it up to your questions. Yes, sir. Sergeant uh, Major, with uh, some, some of the things that came up, have come up over the past year, whether it's the Marines United issue um, or uh, seaworthiness in the Navy with Seventh Fleet issues, how much has, have senior enlisted personnel across, across the services um, borne the responsibility for some, of, for some of these issues, whether they be accidents, training issues, uh, personnel issues? How much of it has fallen on the officers, whereas some of this should have, should have fallen on the shoulders of senior enlisted personnel? And do you think senior enlisted personnel have stepped up to the plate enough on some of these issues? So I'll start off with that, sir, and then I'll ask my colleagues to answer. First of all, anytime it comes to anything accident related or something that affects uh, the health or, or safety of our men and women, all leaders have to be involved from the deck plate level all the way to the senior level. So we take all of these cases seriously and, and leader empowerment and leader engagement is something that we talk about all the time. And uh, Gio, I've asked you to comment on that if you could. Um, so if you're not aware, you know, of course, you know, initial accountability was, uh, you know, those things have already been administered. But uh, so that immediate assessment was kind of already done. But we've also just recently established a convening authority. The Vice Chief of Naval Operations established a convening authority to kind of look at that, uh, that accountability picture holistically, dot the I's, cross the T's, and uh, look at all avenues of responsibility associated with some of those cases. And I'd ask uh, Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps to also to comment. I mean, to your point, sir, um, you know, when General Neller, the commandant of the Marine Corps, uh, went before the SASC and, and, and testified, you know, about Marines United, uh, you don't normally see the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, you know, with the, with the commandant or any of us in front of the SASC. But that particular day, I was there with him. And that was for accountability 
to show the entire Marine Corps, Corps and the world that senior enlisted are being held accountable. And uh, I invite that. I invite that. Because most of what they were talking about was enlisted business. Leadership is a team. It's a team. And that's the way we show up, not just for the good, but for those things that go wrong as well. Tara. Thank you, sir. Um, excuse my voice, I'm getting over a cold. But uh, over the last few years, as the service chiefs have gone up to the Hill, they have repeatedly warned lawnmakers that the amount of risk the forces were taking was increasing. And I wanted to ask, given the accidents, given some of the drops in readiness, are we at the point where the force is breaking? And going into 2018, if kind of going across the board, if each of you could say, what is the thing that worries you the most going into 2018, whether it's the readiness of your rotary aircraft, your uh, you know, ground forces, <coughs> just give us some specifics of what you worry about into this next year. So I'll answer first, and then Dan, we'll start with you to go down the line here. Um, you know, over the past 16 years, because of our high operational tempo, because of unstable budgets and things like that, we haven't been able to get after modernization or maintenance like we would like to. However, having said all of that, uh, there's three absolutes that uh, we believe in. And that's we, we absolutely still, as a U.S. Armed Force, can defend our homeland and our way of life. We can absolutely meet our alliance commitments and, uh, and support our partners. And we absolutely have war fighting advantages in every war fighting domain, specifically in the human domain. Back to your question, sir. No other nation in the world empowers and entrusts enlisted leaders like we do. And I think uh, that we can still absolutely do all three of those things. So, Dan, we'll, we'll go to you about the 2018. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, you know, the world is a very complex environment, and the Army is a very busy organization, along with uh, my counterparts that are sitting here today. Um, and to say that we don't assume risk in places uh, would just not be true. We do. Um, we have to manage that. And that's why the service chiefs have, have made their testimony on the amount of risk that they feel that we are assuming. Uh, what I worry about in 2018 is to make sure that we have uh, predictable and consistent funding in order to make sure that our soldiers are resourced appropriately, one, for the threat and prepare for any emerging threats. Um, we have a simultaneous mission. We have to assure, deter, and possibly defeat our potential allies. So that's probably my biggest uh, worry for the for 2018. One second, sir. Uh, Steve, the 2018. I would say for the Coast Guard, anyway, even though we are considered one of the five armed services, I don't worry as much because have you seen over the last three months with the Coast Guard's heavy involvement with hurricane, uh, the three hurricanes that we had in the Caribbean, uh, we really, I think, showed up uh, as a small service, uh, degraded our readiness to some, some degree, but we saved over 12,000 lives, uh, often with equipment that's very old. And this mantra that we've heard about uh, doing more with less, the Coast Guard doesn't buy into that anymore uh, because we shouldn't be doing more with less. We should be, ex our folks should expect to get the resources they need to do their job that the American public expects them to do. Uh, so I don't worry as much. I think our folks are doing very well. The morale is high. We enjoy a very high retention rate in our service, uh, despite all the heavy work that we've done on top of all the other missions that your Coast Guard <coughs> has to do so. Uh, I think I, I'll agree with Sergeant Major of the Army. A predictable and consistent budget process will help some of that, but I don't, I don't worry that much about it. I think we have a strong enough voice that we'll, uh, we'll get that message across loud and clear over the next few months. And last but not least, Kay Wright. Yeah, so from the Air Force perspective, uh, I, I agree with Sergeant Major of the Army that a uh, predictable budget is, is the thing that concerns me the most, making sure that we can continue to uh, invest in research and development. We can continue to pour money into recapping the, the, the weapon systems that we have and and also uh, increase our to continue our increase in, in manpower so we're on a pretty pretty uh, good pace to increase the manpower that we have in areas like maintenance and space and cyber so that we can continue to the, the things that we do the best uh, from an air power perspective yes sir or you talk a little bit about recruiting particularly with the army the army is bringing in more cat four <coughs> soldiers those who scored the lowest on the aptitude tests the Army was considering and then rescinded bringing in those with uh, mental illnesses. So I want you all to talk about your challenges with recruiting, particularly with regard to the Army, and are you worried that you're clearly bringing in a lower quality recruit? What impact that going to have on the force? Okay, I'll, I'll start and then we'll start down here again and go this way. Um, 
from a Department of Defense and from a joint perspective, we understand that uh, in order to get the talent we need for the force we need now and in the future, we got to continue to prospect for that talent. And we can't rely solely on processing, meaning that we've got to have men and women that are out there in our recruiting commands that are going out and actively engaging key leaders, key spheres of influence in the community to find the kind of talent we need, especially in specialties like cyber or people that can excel in the nuclear uh, domain or in space. So that's kind of our focus from a DOD and a joint staff perspective, our way down on each of the services. Go ahead, Dan. Sure. It just, uh, just one comment back with, with regards to your statement, sir, with us intending to bring people in with uh, mental or behavioral health issues or concerns. That was never the intent. Everything is done from a waiver process. We meet, and we have met, and we will continue to meet all DOD mandated thresholds for for uh, our entry-level soldiers from our Sessions Command. We haven't. Um, year to year, we get closer um, or farther away from the DOD standard, um, but we have always exceeded the DOD standard. I mean far away from not making it, but we've always exceeded, and we'll continue to do that. Um, sessions is tough. It's a tough mission. But you're bringing in more Cat 4, aren't you? I'd have, to, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. That's what I've, I've been told. Yeah, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers. Um, as we talked right today, are you talking 2000 previous well, year current. or, or yeah. current? current. Yeah, I, have to, I don't know. I have to go back and look at the numbers, the number of Cat 4s we have. What we do is we don't look at it from um, a snapshot in time. We have an annual requirement to make a DOD standard, and, uh, and our team down at USREC says that they're going to meet or exceed that DOD standard for the year. From a Marine, from a Marine Corps perspective, sir, uh, we meet, we've met our, our recruiting goals. However, we're looking at, you know, um, what's happening out in our nation with those we recruit. Uh, when you talk about millennials, when you talk about the IGNs, it's really understanding what's going on, you know, um, out, outside of the military, outside of DOD, uh, changes that are, that are happening within the culture, just, I mean, over evolution. So understanding that and understanding the impact that it has on the service and what type of programs you need to meet those challenges or those changes. That's what we're looking at um, when you talk about emotional intelligence, the different types of, you know, um, uh, tests out there to, to, to take a look at that. We owe that to the people. We owe that to the public. We owe that to those we recruit to put them in the best situation, to put this, this building, our nation, in the best situation to win the war. So quality of personnel will always be looked at from not just from the sessions, but also from from retention, from retention. And then we have a we have a, a responsibility to re to return better citizens to the nation. So that quality is being looked at all across the spectrum, sir. One thing I'll add before I go on to the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Navy: if you look at our recruiting standards and our access and, and enlistment standards, right now, around 25 percent of all 18 to 24 year olds in the United States qualify for military service. So the men and women we're bringing in are the best that society has to offer. Yeah, I, you know, we've met uh, recruiting efforts um, for over 10 years now. We've met our recruiting goals. And uh, that's both in the active component and the reserve component. And uh, the talent across that timeline continues to be better than uh, the people before them. And you can look at the metrics that will attest to that. They come in more capable, uh, better educated than we were when we assessed into the service. And uh, we continue to go at that, that talent out there uh, in the civilian sector. Uh, by all measures, we are a reflection of society. And, uh, and we all recruit to, uh, to assess that talent, just like uh, the civilian sector does as well. But we look at, you know, the health of the force through the same external factors that the Sergeant Major talked about uh, in regards to how's the economy doing, how's the employment rate doing out there. And then we also look at the internal factors that policies and programs that we control as well, too, to uh, continue to ensure that we're assessing that talent. Okay. Okay. Nope, no real recruiting challenges for the Air Force, so recruiting for all of us. Uh, it it's, can be tough at times with the number of people who are, one, eligible to serve, and two, some things that we, we may not think about, but those who have the propensity and want to, to serve. And as we, uh, you know, uh, 
compete with colleges and, and other opportunities, the, the economy for, for folks to go and do. But Air Force, we do a, a pretty good job of, of recruiting and, and meeting the goals that we have. And, and like I mentioned before, uh, we're on a pretty good uh, glide path to increase our manning and, and meet our requirements. Steve. And I'll say the Coast Guard's had very, uh, very well with our recruiting over the last few years. Even though we've increased a little bit, we continue to make our goals. Uh, with an effort on investing in these folks as soon as they come into the service. And that's starting, uh, we're, we're thinking when they join our Coast Guard that we're going to keep them for 20 or 30 years. And we start their investment from recruit training all the way through uh, their advancement through their first enlistments, which by the way, we enjoy about a 90% retention rate at that first enlistment. So good, in fact, and I won't pick on my brothers here, but uh, we get an awful lot of prior service that come in our service. And I would, I would put the challenge out there for, for my, my friends up here to find me a United States Coast Guardsman that left the Coast Guard and went to one of their services. <laughs> and I'll buy them lunch if that happens. But, uh, but we're Coast doing Guards very well in our folks. Serve in the Air Force, so. yeah. <laughs> Except the Air Force. But we're doing well. Yeah. How concerned are all of you with the spike in the aircraft crashes this year? I like so, the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I try not to get too concerned about uh, some of these crashes. We, we try to look at each, each of them individually and do the in-depth uh, research and analysis uh, about why. Uh, thus far, from the Air Force perspective, we haven't seen any uh, real trends that indicate there's a, an Air Force-wide problem. Uh, but we'll continue to take a look at each one of those as, uh, as they happen uh, from an uh, operational risk management perspective. Go ahead, Ron. You know, some of those crashes are probably you know, focused at the Marine Corps. Um, like uh, Chief Master in the Air Force said, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned with each one of them. But I understand we had about 155 Marines die last year, about 20 or this, this year, uh, last fiscal year, in aircraft. Not just the aircraft, but every, every incident we're concerned with, every one of them. The vehicular accidents, you know, everything. Uh, some things you can't, you know, help sicknesses and things, disease, those type of uh, situations. But we look at those as well to see if we missed something. What is it that we missed? You know, we fought for 16 years, and we're still in the fight. And we're, we're doing very well. We're winning. But understand, 16 years of war, you know, it, it has consequences. It has consequences. Despite the consequences of fighting, you know, OEF, OIF, and everything we're doing now, we're still winning. We're still winning. So we're going to look at each one of those, not just that the, the, the aircraft, you know, crashes that we have, but every death that we have in the military, especially in the Marine Corps. I'm speaking from a core perspect perspective, but I know each one of us feel this way. We're going to look at each one of them, and we're going to do our best, you know, to put, put policy procedure in place if that's what's lacking. Um, training, whatever it is, we're going to get after it. So I'd just like to finish that one off. So when you look at what we're doing across the world in terms of what we need to do to assure our allies, deter any kind of nation state or non-state actor <laughs> aggression, be able to do the lasting defeat of ISIS, and also defend our homeland, that, that comes at a, a, a great cost in terms of deployment. And you, you look at 196 nations in the world, we're in about 167 of them right now. Uh, at about 250,000 troops doing that. So when you put the troops out there like that and the operational tempo goes up, obviously the risk goes up. But what we have to do, and just to echo what the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps said, we have to make sure that we look at every accident and we do a, an investigation of where we need to get better at and where we don't allow this to happen again. But two, we also have to continue to develop our leaders to not only be able to mitigate risk, but to anticipate and communicate that risk both up and down the chain as we move forward. Sergeant Major, aren't you concerned that twice as many U.S. troops have been killed in aviation crashes this year compared to last year? Absolutely. We're concerned about, we, absolutely we're concerned about that. But most importantly, we're concerned about any death we have, whether it's combat related or non-combat related. Um, but here recently, you know, we've had a lot more non-combat related deaths. So we really have to look internally at ourselves with a critical lens to see where we, we need to get better at in terms of handling risk and getting better at being safe. A lot of 
Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are saying the U.S. military is in a crisis right now. All these different accents, whether it's on the air, land, or sea. Is the military in crisis right now? From my perspective, from a joint perspective, I, I don't think we're in crisis right now. I'll let the individual services answer on that. Dan? No, I don't see this in a crisis at all. Like I said, we, are, we live in a very complex environment. That complex environment is going to create, uh, you know, challenges for the military. Um, but we have and we'll continue to overcome each one of those challenges. And, you know, to, to people looking on the outside looking in, it's so like whack-a-mole. You know, if it's not aircraft next year, whatever that high number is, we're going to be talking about it. So whatever that high number is, we're going to get after it. We're going to get after it. Um, it's aircraft this year. But you look at the aircraft, you know, perspective years before. The, what's happening now, that's exactly what we're studying. Is it, you know, depth to dwell? Is it leader to lead? What, what exactly it is? We'll get after it as we've done in the past, and we'll, we'll make that correction, and we'll still be the most lethal force on the face of this earth. Go ahead. You know, I travel the world, and I get out and I have a conversation with a lot of sailors, a lot of family members as well, too. And uh, you can look them all in the eye. And uh, first and foremost, I'll tell you, they love being a United States Navy sailor. I love being a United States Navy sailor. And uh, there's nothing else I'd rather be doing right now. And we ask uh, our sailors to operate across the globe on a number of different platforms. And sometimes tragedy happens. And that's an unfortunate, inherent nature of our business. And. Uh, but our sailors need to have trust and confidence in their leaders that we'll learn from these things and we'll go at this stuff. And there'll be some things that we can take care of quickly. There'll be some things that we'll have to look at over the, over the interim. And then there may be some long-term things that, that we can kind of go after and, and correct things on. And our sailors know that about our leadership. <coughs> and I, I don't worry about whether sailors are ready to take the fight to the fight. I don't worry about that because they will, because that's just who we are as U.S. Navy sailors. And that's what our nation asks us to be for them. And we'll keep being those people. But we'll keep learning through these things as well, too. And, uh, and, and that's just kind of, I think, how we view things here in the Navy today. Yeah, just to get to the brunt of your question, I don't believe we're in a crisis, uh, obviously, in a, uh, a risk-based business like combat arms, specifically aviation. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll have some, some accidents, you'll have incidents. I think the most important thing that, that all of us, uh, again, take a look at is we put the right amount of resources and energy toward investigating those specific incidents and, and learning from them and growing from them. I, I have a high level of confidence in our uh, aviation community uh, as a, from an Air Force perspective, uh, all of our uh, pilots, our instructor pilots, and the programs that, that we implement to after the T-38 crash last week, are those still grounded? Uh, I believe, I, I, I'm not quite sure, but I'll, I'll I get back to you. Follow. One of the points that came out in the recent hearings following some of the Navy collisions um, was the inability for the services to say no when asked to fill a COCOM requirement. And what I am hearing today, and I just want to see if I'm hearing correctly, is that there really is that kind of inability to say no. You will meet what the partners want, you'll meet what the co-coms want. You can, I've heard it, you can do all of these things, but there definitely seems to be a consequence. So, you know, is well, there an inability to I, say no? I would no? have to say that at all levels, you know, commanders manage risk at all levels. And when it comes, when, when we say, you know, we have to defend our homeland, obviously we're going to get after that mission of defending the homeland, whether that's at sea, in the air, or on the ground, or wherever it's at. Um, but commanders at all levels are charged, and, and senior enlisted at all levels, are charged to manage the risk at their appropriate level and to get after that. So I go back to what I said earlier. I don't think we have a systemic problem in terms of, you know, being unsafe or whatever it is. I just think we have to continue to look at these incidents, and we got to figure out where the problem is and, and attack it from that angle. So. Go ahead. And if I can say something, ma'am, let me tell you that I can tell you now, we, we get more requests than we feel. I can tell you that. We do not feel every request for forces that comes out of there. You all just don't get to hear about everything. And that's a good thing. 
because we're not into giving in any any advantages. We don't fill every. We fill the requests that we think we can do, and the commandant accepts the amount of risk that he think is appropriate. But that conversation between the COCOMs, you know, and the service chiefs, that's that's at their level. And if we're filling the request, it's because we know we can do the job. And Tara, just to finish out, I've sat in some tank meetings with the chairman, the service chiefs, and the combatant commanders. And when they talk about capabilities and requirements, what they always talk about is the risk to the force and the risk to mission. And then even so much the service chiefs will talk about the risk to the institution. If we continue to do business like this, how will it affect our services in the near future or the long term?